Now, what I'm going to be talking to you about is the Battle of Vimy Ridge and a regiment from the Okanagan Valley, the, um, the Second Canadian Mounted Rifles. Now, this is the Guidon of the British Columbia Dragoons, which is the direct ancestor of the Second Canadian Mounted Rifles. They, they changed their name in 1929 to the British Columbia Dragoons so they would never be used as infantry again. Uh, and they weren't. In the World War II, they were, were tanks, so we'll get into that. We'll be looking at the battle honours, uh, briefly Mount Sorel, Somme, and Fleur Corselet. But the big battle honour we're going to look at is Vimy. But in order to really understand that, you really know, need to know a little bit about what happened before. So um, the regiment's over 100 years old now. It started in 1911. And its present name is the British Columbia Dragoons. And I had the honour of serving in it for 18 years. Uh, and I have 20 year, 25 years total of military service. I've served in, I've been an infantry officer, a platoon commander in the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, and a uh, troop leader and tank commander in the British Columbia Dragoons. Um, so the, the regiment started off as an independent cavalry squadron in, in Vernon in 1908. Eventually they will have a squadron down here in Penticton, but that won't be till after the, the First World War, not till 1920 will Penticton get its squadron. Penticton will have a squadron until 1970 when it will lose it by the decrees of the federal government under Pierre Elliott Trudeau and a massive military downsizing. We will attempt to reinstate that uh, third squadron or C squadron uh, about 10 years ago and it, the, 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 that attempt will, will fail as well. So it's not for lack of effort. Um, but anyway, uh, no one is the Okanagan Mounted Rifles to start with. Then it became, becomes the 1st Regiment, British Columbia Horse, which is a name they kind of like. They'll, they'll say British Columbia Horse on their hat badges in parentheses in World War I. Um, and squadrons Lumby, Vernon, Armstrong, and Kelowna. They'll become also the 30th BC Horse in 1912. But BC Horse is the name they seem to like the most before World War I. Uh, cavalry trained in reconnaissance. They have rifles. Could fight if dismounted, if required, primary weapons, the rif uh, rifle. And their mission is to secure from the Canadian border to the Canadian, the CPR rail line. From Canadian border from Asoyas to Kamloops. And I often ask my students, who are they securing the border from? <laughs> Obviously the Americans, but the Americans are, are no longer really a threat. It's, uh, I have talked to gentlemen who were in the regiment in its horse cavalry days. and. Uh, some of them say it was more like a riding club. Um, but the thing was, you got a dollar a day if you were reservist in those days, which was, which was um, basically minimum wage, uh, wages for a day is a dollar. But your horse, if you brought your horse on exercise, your horse also got a dollar a day. So you could make double the money of, of a reserve infantryman. Um, now, the second thing about rifles, brackets, uh, BC, British Columbia horse, Trenches are battled from 3rd of October 1915, 11 November 1918. And right now I want to address a myth that uh, World War I was bloodier than World War II. The big difference for the Canadian Army is in World, in World War I, we had three full years in combat with the main German army. In World War II, we had a little over one year in main combat, 11 months in Northwest Europe against the main German army. And we lost 40,000 men in World War II, 60,000 in World War I. But in World War II, we had half the contact time. If we'd had twice the contact time, the same contact time as World War I, proportionally our casualties would have been 80,000 in World War II and 60,000 in World War I. The casualty rate in World War I at, uh, in 1917 at Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele was the same as for the Normandy beachhead. I'll get students tell me, oh, the casualties are less because of tanks and aircraft. No, look at the Russian front and 25 million dead. You can die in heck high technology equipment as well. It's the contact time. We had more time in direct contact with one of the best armies in the world that was trying to kill us. And the only way we could win this war was by aggressive offensive action. Uh, the third principle of warfare. First principle is selection and maintenance of the aim. Second principle is maintenance of morale. Third principle is offensive action. You have to get out of your trench and you have to attack. And the only attacks, uh, it's a frontal attack. There's no way to do a flank attack. It's especially at the Canadian uh, core level. Now, the uh, war came and uh, 
I won't get into the reasons for that because uh, we don't really have time for it. Uh, and here's the central mobilization camp. Vernon was a central mobilization camp for British Columbia. So all the soldiers who went overseas in the first couple of years of the war would train in Vernon in the summertime. And Vernon went out over Kamloops for this honor, okay? Because Kamloops was too dusty. And what, the, what Vernon did was they ran out a water line and a power line and a telephone line, kind of like set up a bird's nest and hope the bird will come. Vernon has had a policy of pro-military for over 100 years. And then Kamloops got jealous and they managed to get uh, the Mid-Canada line, but that's, that's, that's much later. Um, and notice the tents, these are, are bell tents, and that's where the soldiers are sleeping. And these big marquee tents would be for classrooms and kitchens and dining halls and headquarters. Uh, here's uh, boxing, a popular sport. Um, and there's the soldiers lined up in, in a coulee, uh, 1916, watching boxing. And I, I tried to find the same coulee in 2013. And now that instead of, uh, instead of the horses, you uh, have uh, a golf course. So this is just behind the tourist information booth in, in Vernon. I try to do this uh, time travel as much as I can. It's really interesting to come, you know, go back 100 years. Um, here's Storming Hill, Camp Vernon, uh, 1916. And the soldiers are formed up in assault formation and they're practicing uh, storming the hill. This is where the nature center is today. And if you ever look at it while you're driving by on Highway 97 and it looks a bit lumpy, that, that's why. Uh, here's what it looks like today. And here we have advancing to the second line of trenches, 1916. They're wearing straw hats. Um, the uh, metal helmets have just come in, but the metal helmets are for overseas uh, troops. Uh, just like today, uh, a full suit of Kevlar battle on armor costs about $18,000. So that goes to troops overseas, troops on workup training. Uh, so these guys are wearing straw hats. They know straw hats are useless in combat, but the metal helmets are going to soldiers who are on the front line. Uh, some of these uh, men you see here will be uh, in Vimy Ridge, and they're practicing going up a hill. Uh, they're practicing what they're going to have to do in about a year. Here's a diagram of frontline trench. Uh, I don't know why that didn't all make it on there, but uh, you've got uh, machine gun positions that fire uh, to the front, and there's a, a beaten zone, a killing zone where the machine guns hit. Uh, the trenches go up and down. This is a, a, a bird's eye view. So that if the enemy captures this 10 meter bay, he can't just shoot up and down it. But if you're, if you're the Canadians and you capture this bay, you have to fight your way around the corner with uh, rifles and hand grenades so that you, it's uh, very difficult to take a trench line. And this is the um, uh, support line with uh, bunkers and uh, things like uh, 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 latrines, and uh, there'll be another trench line like this, uh, 100, 200 meters back, a rifle shot back, and a third one uh, back another, uh, another couple hundred meters. So if you take one trench line, there's always two others behind it, triple line of defense. And here's a side view of a trench. They go down, uh, uh, you want it so your head is below the parapet here, and so you're walking on the sole of the trench, and this is the fire step, you stand up on that in order to shoot over. Uh, how deep these are, uh, over six feet deep, uh, I did a, a tug a trench with the Clarence Fulton High School students up in Vernon beside the old armory. Took the, we were down to about this depth by noon. Okay, so eight, you know your average teenager can do it if they have somebody like me driving them. Uh, yeah, then they can do it. And then you don't have you know at night time these trenches be dug. They're 500 kilometers long from the Swiss border to the North Sea, uh, and, and and triple line at least. And now in front, you put barbed wire, but not your casual three-strand uh, barbed wire, massive thickets of it. Here's uh, the British invented tanks to crush the barbed wire. Winston Churchill was Lord of the Admiralty, and he uh, authorized the first armored vehicles, the tanks. And the tank was, they, were, just, they had to hide them, so they put canvas over them. What could they be? Water tanks, and the name stuck. It was actually a, just a way to hide them. Uh, Churchill, by the way, kept them top secret from his fellow cabinet ministers because he was worried if the word got out, the funding would get cut. He wasn't worried about the enemy. He was worried about his own fellow cabinet ministers because he's the Lord of the Admiralty, and this has nothing to do with ships. He had a few of his men were dismounted in, in a naval uh, infantry division, so he thought maybe they could use these. And Churchill was very uh, intelligent. 
He did a couple of mistakes, but, but he's, uh, and he's remembered for those as well. Um, here's the second Canadian Mounted Rifles. Uh, what I want you to notice here is the First Nation soldiers, uh, and also the ages. Like, uh, their ages uh, basically are supposed to be from uh, uh, 19 or 18 to 45, but you'll get some guys who uh, maybe are a little north of 45, and you get some other guys that might be a little south of 18. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the head of the lake band, which is now the, uh, the, uh, the Vernon uh, Okanagan Nation, um, the, uh, the history of that uh, band is that when World War I came, every able-bodied man joined. They had 100% voluntary enlistment. Uh, the First Nations uh, shocked us, and they came forward in overwhelming numbers. It wasn't like we treated them well. Uh, by 1911, they, didn't, they couldn't, couldn't vote. We were taking away, expropriating huge chunks of the reserve. But when the war came, they joined up. Uh, we often put them in sniper and scout platoon, uh, which, uh, okay, what I tell my students is Canada was racist, all right? Let's get over that. Uh, but we were selective racist. If you were native, well, obviously you're a good shot, so we'll put you in sniper. You're obviously good in the woods, so, so scout. If you're, say, Japanese, well, you're a good warrior, but your eyesight's bad, so combat infantry. Chinese, well, uh, labor battalion, oh, not labor battalion, railway labor battalion, so making light railways behind the line. If you're black, labor battalion. Um, and uh, so it goes, okay? So we were selectively racist, all right? So once you, you know, but what was amazing was that the, the fact that, you know, Chinese Canadians stuck up their hands, Japanese Canadians stuck up their hands, and the First Nations wanted to go. Okay. Here's the second Canadian Mounted Rifles uh, tents, and there's the armory in Vernon. And what we're going to do now is flash forward 100 years, okay? Uh, this is the Vernon uh, Hospital. Uh, uh, this is the detention barracks left over from World War II. This is a, a junior ranks mess. So those, these buildings have now disappeared. The only building that's left is that uh, brick armory from 1913. So the horses uh, aren't going to go into the trenches. Originally, the second Canadian Mounted Rifles was designated to go to uh, uh, Egypt to fight the Turks, which the guys thought was going to be pretty exciting and would have been and relatively low casualty as well. I accept that uh, there was enough Australians to do that, so we were going to go into the trenches in France so the horses would get left behind. Here's the second Canadian Mounted Rifle. And why are we named the second Canadian Mounted Rifles? We're the BC horse, but we're going to be part of, um, of a whole um, brigade, uh, almost a division of mounted rifles. Uh, so you ride on horse to combat, and you get off your horse, and uh, uh, my dear uh, colleague and former uh, commander, uh, uh, Paul Randall brought this wonderful uh, collection of mounted rifle hat badges. And also the Canadian part is initially we're going to be British Columbian and very proud of it. But by the time 1918 rolls around, there aren't a lot of British Columbians to go around. Uh, this valley had close to 15% voluntary enlistment of all able-bodied men between 18 and 45. To put that in perspective, Newfoundland, which is very patriotic, had one in three voluntary enlistment. Same with Ontario. So when conscription finally came in in 1917, frankly, there wasn't anybody left to conscript in British Columbia. So the reinforcements that we get in 1918, as uh, McGregor said, came from a province which will not be named. And it starts with O. Okay. Um, the 1st Battalion commander had experience in the Boer War. He's a, a former British officer, and he was a, a manager of the Coldstream Ranch, and that's Lieutenant Colonel uh, Bott, Cecil Bott. But he'll get invalided out from, with bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, in 1916. Here's the 2nd uh, Canadian Mounted Rifles. They really train in Victoria. After they train in Vernon, they go to Victoria, and they pick up another independent squadron of horse. So the, their fourth rifle company will actually be from Victoria. So three quarters Okanagan and one quarter Victoria. And that's going to come back in our narrative, okay? It, and there actually is a monument to the 2nd CMR inside the legislature in uh, Victoria, okay? Because part of our manpower will come from Victoria. I love this picture. You see a, a soldier uh, on a, a cot here, a uh, sergeant major here, uh, the soldier's packing up. Uh, their bell tents. They still have horses here. That's why they're in the uh, in the park, um, uh, the, where the where the horses can be stabled. And here they are, leaving Victoria for England. There's Colonel Bott, and there are the soldiers. 
This is a wonderful picture. They're on the ferry going to Vancouver to get on the train. What's good about this picture is, look at how keen these guys get look. They are on the biggest adventure of their lives. This is 1915 and they're going to the big adventure. They're going to world, well, they're not calling it World War I. They're calling it the Great War, just like we don't call it the first Afghan war, okay? You know, the first Canadian Afghan war, we just call it the, uh, the, experience, the, uh, the mission in Afghanistan. But look at the women. She doesn't look quite as happy. She doesn't look particularly happy. Look at her. She's got her hand on his knee. That is extremely forward for 1915. Um, this is uh, one, two, three. There's four men here. Uh, three of them will be killed or wounded. One will get home unscratched physically. So the odds were if you joined up in 1915 in the Okanagan Valley, 67% chance you will be killed or wounded. It, it's horrible. Okay, now the distinguishing packages of Canadian units in the field. We will put together four divisions, first, second, third, and fourth Canadian divisions. Um, these divisions, by the way, still exist. Uh, we've uh, restructured our army and we brought back the old names. Um, because we had all these 1968 Land Force Western Area, which nobody else in the world understood. But when we called it 3rd Canadian Division, all of a sudden the Americans can understand it. And it's also our heritage. We threw it away in the 60s. We, um, uh, we did some unification. Uh, the second Canadian Mounted Rifles are here. This is the badge that they'll wear, uh, with the flash they'll wear on their shoulders. Now it's pretty plain. I mean, the Americans have screaming eagles and horses and everything. This is basically like the, the, the quartermaster had some different colored blankets and cut them up. But you know, it's, just, yeah, it's pretty simple. But there we are. Uh, there's the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. There's the Royal Canadian Regiment. These are permanent, for, permanent regiments today in the regular force. And now a division would consist of about 25,000 men. Another 25,000 here. 25,000 air, 25,000 air. These are the, the, the core headquarters troops. And there's going to be about 10,000 men here. These are people who lay the telephone lines. Uh, these are uh, motor machine gun units with armored cars. Um, so uh, these are supply units. Um, there's, there's a lot. Um, there's about, uh, about 150,000 men in the field. And the casualty rate in 1917 will be 102%. So you have to replace everybody. That's why we have 600,000 men in the Canadian for Army in World War I, but never more than about 125,000 or 200,000 in the field at any one time. But they're gonna be need to be replaced because they will get killed and wounded. Now, Canadian manufactured 303 Ross rifle. There it is, tended to jam under rapid fire conditions. And if you were a conservative officer, you, you supported it because the conservative party purchased it. If you were a liberal officer, you opposed it because it was a useless rifle in combat. It was an excellent sniper rifle, very finely uh, um, tuned. Uh, it could, we won the Bisley Rifle Competition, which is a competition held with all the British Empire. We still, we still send teams to it. It's now the Commonwealth uh, Rifle Competition. We won one year, and the Australians, New Zealanders said, hey, that's not your issue, rifle. And Sir Sam Hughes, our Minister of National Defense, said, now it is. Um, the trouble with it was, finely milled, it would tend to overheat and um, jam at about the fifth round of rapid fire. Sometimes when you fired it, the, the, the bayonet broke. Um, but it was the, the fifth, round, fifth or sixth round rapid fire is when it jams. And that's about when the Germans are in the barbed wire to your front and then you're trying to unjam it and get it to work. Um, I know the British get criticized for being uh, incompetent and pig-headed, but it was the British that ordered us to get rid of this rifle in 1916. General Douglas Haig, Field Marshal Haig, said uh, you need to get rid of it, and uh, so we finally did. And then when we did get rid of it, it turned out that 30,000 of our soldiers already had the replacement rifle. There's the, the Ross rifle. Uh, the one we, the British were using the short magazine Lee Enfield rifle, which is this one, and it turned out about, I um, uh, was it 25,000 or 27,000 of our soldiers already had that rifle. What they had done on the field of battle was that they found a what they call a dead Imperial soldier because we were all British. Uh, in in the book at the time that we wrote, we are not talking about the British and the Canadians. We're talking about the Imperials, the Canadians, the New Zealanders, the Australians. We're not using the term British uh, except to, to mean all of us. 
because we're all one big uh, imperial family. But the imperials are the what we would now call the British. Um, so whenever a Canadian soldier sees a dead imperial soldier, he trades rifles with them because uh, he can take that rifle with him to Valhalla. Uh, now, we had uh, the regiment had brought Colt uh, machine guns, uh, American made from Canada. Uh, the British gave us Vickers machine guns. I'm going to use the term British because that's understandable. Um, we um, had in the platoons, uh, the 40-man the platoons, Lewis machine guns, uh, light machine guns. By 1918, each section of 10 men will have one of these. Uh, there will be more and more machine guns as the war goes on. Um, and the, the Lewis gun has a 30-round magazine on top of it. Here's uh, the hand grenade, the number five is Mills bomb. Uh, very useful in trench clearing because you have to throw hand grenades to go around the corners. Here's with a rod for launching from a rifle. So you put the rod down the rifle. The trouble with you launch, the rifles you use to launch these things, it ruins the rifle very quickly. So if you're going to use the rifle for launching grenades, the grenade launching rifle, that's all you, well, you can, you can shoot it, but don't expect any accuracy after you've uh, fired a couple of these. There's the Battle of, of Somme is the next big one for the unit. The unit did not go over the top on the first day. Uh, the Newfoundlanders did, but they weren't part of the Canadian Army then. They were part of the Imperial Army. They were a, a separate dominion from Canada, um, and uh, they had a horrible time. We are, we're a little later in the Somme. We're not until all the uh, first uh, uh, flush is over. So we're going to get in on the 13th of September, and our experience is kind of interesting. On the night of the 13th of September, one of our patrol in no man's land under Corporal Stevenson found and brought in three Australians who had been lying in a shell hole for 11 days. One was unwounded, but had stayed with his wounded pals, getting rations and water at night from the dead lying close by. None of them knew they were in no man's land, but thought they were behind the German lines. And this is uh, jo Johnson in, in the uh, book he wrote about the second CMRs. So they're into the line, and there's a whole bunch of dead Australians. There's dead Australians everywhere. And there's so many of them that the ones that are alive are getting food and rations out of the packs of the dead ones. 11 days lying out in no man's land. So uh, I thought that's kind of unusual. So I researched a little deeper and uh, there was a battle, um, uh, a farm, Moquette Farm. In the regimental history, uh, we come into the line uh, on the 13th and we're ordered to take it three days later on the 16th, we take it. But then, I looked, I googled and did some research and there's Moquette Farm there and there's a monument that's AIF, Australian Imperial Force. So uh, for four weeks, uh, the men of the 1st, 2nd and 4th Australian divisions, that's 25,000 men each, took part in seven major attacks that dislodged the Germans from deep defenses at Moquette Farm, surrounding trench systems. And then on the 16th of September, 2nd CMR uh, moved into the line and they captured it in one night. We did the reconnaissance uh, early in the evening and we put in the attack and there, before it got dawn and we took it. And we did some really incredible things. Uh, uh, George uh, Perks, who will eventually become the Lieutenant Governor of the province of British Columbia, threw live mortar rounds down the German bunkers when they wouldn't come up to surrender because they were deep down, like they said. Um, we, uh, we had crews to entrench the system and bring it into our line of trenches. Uh, we held it. And then we were ordered to hand it over to an imperial battalion, the Dorsets from the Midlands, and, and they lost it. Uh, but uh, we took it. And the Australian history has us mentioned, but this is now we're getting into dicey territory. These are brave men, okay? They may not be as well led as the second CMR. They may not, the plans may not be as good, but they died and they died for Australia. Uh, and they died for Britain. Um, and when you have the Canadians come and take objectives that Australians and British were unable to take, um, they're not necessarily going to stand by and applaud you. But they will remember you when something bad needs to be done again. But it's now where, you know, these guys are brave too. Um, and they're, they're, good, they're good people. And uh, they're dying. And they're dying in enormous numbers. Yeah. So uh, the regiment's getting experience. What I'm trying to tell you is they're getting battle experience. We have Colonel Wisbank Johnson. He is now uh, moving up to command uh, in October. Uh, he's going to win a Distinguished Service Order, Military Cross. Uh, he came from Vernon, and he served in the BC Horse before the war, and he's been learning quite a bit from Colonel Bott. And Bott is going to be invalided out uh, with bronchitis, acute bronchitis. 
He will also be court-martialed for drunkenness on the Western Front in 1916. But by that time, I got a lot of sympathy for Bott, because by that time, over half the regiment he brought from the Okanagan Valley is dead or wounded. I mean, um, and he's coughing as long as he's not going to live beyond 1926 when he gets back to Vernon. Um, I've got a lot of sympathy for him. And what, what is the standard of drunkenness on the Western Front when their soldiers are being issued rum? Yeah, I mean, really, it's going to be uh, quite a standard. So anyway, here is uh, Johnson, and Johnson loves the regiment deeply. His personal diary will become the history. He will, um, he will survive till 1950. When the regimental colors burn down in the church in Vernon, he will replace them in 1950. When he's old and gray and has a cane, he loves this regiment. He will go back, uh, he will go to the dedication of Vimy in 1936 in the middle of the Depression. He'll be the only second CMR I could find from the Okanagan Valley to go because it's an expensive uh, trip to, to France in 1936 when the Depression's on. Um, now, the overall commander of the four divisions of the Canadian Corps is Vivian Bing, and he is the last British commander we have, and he's a, an interesting character. He's, um, he's generally fairly careless in his dress. Um, he had an ancestor, Admiral Bing, Bing who uh, in the wars with France had been ordered to defend uh, some islands in the Mediterranean and had gone and engaged a, a French naval unit, defeated the French Navy, but while he was defeating the French Navy, the French army had managed to land troops on the islands and take them. So his ancestor was tried for failing to achieve his mission and executed on his quarterdeck by his own Marine guards. And Admiral Bing had a handkerchief and he took it out and he told his men to aim true uh, when he dropped it. So he comes from that tradition of where admirals are shot to encourage the others. Uh, he would uh, arrive early for parades, hide behind a hedge on his horse, and then sort of jump out with his horse right on time. He thought he didn't want the soldiers to wait. He hated soldiers to waste their time waiting for generals. He also said to the Canadian Corps, I don't want any man, you know, it's, 19, it's 1916, fall of 1916, 14, 15, 16. We couldn't be said to be, you couldn't be described as winning this war. And if any man has an idea, I don't want him going home to Canada not having said his idea or being listened to. So he's going to listen to the soldiers. What ideas do you have? What can we do to finally win this thing? Because we've lost, by this time we've lost, uh, well, hundreds of thousands of men. Um, uh, his uh, last mission before coming to the Canadian Corps was he commanded the Australians at Gallipoli in the Great Withdrawal. Now, the Australians, their big battle, that they, uh, they celebrate Gallipoli and Suvla Bay, which was, um, was a defeat. We celebrate Vrimi, which is a victory. Um, he got command of the Australians just as they were ordered to withdraw, and he did an absolutely brilliant withdrawal from Gallipoli. The Turks were unaware the Australians had left. He sand, had rifles sandbagged in with jam tins tied to the triggers, so they would, the, uh, the Turks would hear rifle fire coming at them from the Australian lines. So he got the Australians away with virtually no casualties at all. He should have been promoted at that point to army commander. Instead, he's given the Canadian Corps, same, rank, same level of command as he had with the Australians. And why? Well, he's probably one of the most intelligent officers the British had. And they saw a lot of potential in the Canadians. We were doing fairly well at the Somme, even though we didn't know a lot yet. Uh, the, the British thought that with a little bit more guidance, the Canadians would achieve great things. So they gave us him. He loved Canada. He names himself when he becomes a Lord, um, uh, by, uh, 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 was it Lord Bing of Vimy. And after the war, he will request to come as our Governor General. And he will be our Governor General in, 19, in the 1920s. When he comes to the Okanagan Valley, he'll be mobbed. The, the, the retired soldiers call themselves Bing's boys. And uh, they love him. And uh, unfortunately, he runs a fall of a uh, prime minister called William Loyn Mackenzie King uh, and gets kind of chewed up. But here he is as Governor General of Canada. And this is about uh, 10 years later. Notice the difference in his face. He looks like he's younger here. Yeah, and there's a big difference. Well, here he's a general in command of over 100,000 men. And he knows no matter what he does, those men, some of them are going to die. He could have the most brilliant plan, but some of them are going to die. He's got to capture a ridge 
Vimy Ridge from the Germans. And the German army is good. It's one of the best armies the world has ever seen. Uh, and he's got to take this ridge away from them. And they've had two and a half years to fortify it. Now the Moroccans, uh, the French North African Division from Morocco, has managed to capture the foot of the bridge, the ridge. But uh, British troops and French troops, uh, roughly 100,000 casualties failing to hold the ridge. Okay, now there's a monument to the Moroccans below it. So they, they tried valiantly, these are brave men. Um, but Bing is going to uh, do a lot of careful, meticulous planning. And helping him, he has Major General Arthur Curry of Victoria, British Columbia, a reservist before the war, also a high school teacher before the war. Um, notice that British Columbia comes into this narrative more than once. Um, he, uh, he was the first division commander. And um, Bing um, actually uh, leaned on him to produce the plan for the attack. And when the attack succeeded at Vimy, um, Bing got his army promotion. He gets, he gets promoted to army commander. And um, he tells the Canadians and the British High Command that you need a general to command the Canadians, and they should have a Canadian general. And uh, Arthur Curry should be that general. He'll get a knighthood, uh, and he will command the Canadian Corps to the end of the war. He will win every single battle he is given. Only one bad thing. We will blame him for every one of those 60,000 men that die in the war. He will be the last Canadian soldier to return overseas in 1919. When he gets to Halifax, the pier will be empty. There will be one staff officer to see him. No band, no mayor, no nothing. And he knows what's going to happen. I'm going to get blamed for every man that died. And we do. We blame him. We didn't put up a statue until 2001. Uh, so he gets out of the Canadian Army after the war and becomes Chancellor of McGill University. And of course, the, the professors, I can tell you, academics, they don't, they, they, there is an antipathy between the academic world and the military world. I know because I was in both, I am in both world wars, uh, both, both worlds. Uh, when, he, when he takes over McGill, what he does is he says, well, we need the best professors, uh, so we should pay the best salaries. So he increases all the professor's salaries by 50%, and he becomes a god. They, have a stat they put a statue up to him at McGill. Uh, and then he goes out and does fundraising and expands their medical department. Uh, but, uh, but now, he, he's, he's brilliant in planning. He is meticulous. He is thorough. He's not particular, particularly charismatic, and that's one of his failings. Um, so he, he will uh, command to the end of the war. He's considered to be the best general Canada has ever produced. And he will have to fight a libel suit, uh, a suit which he will win in the 1930s, where they call him a bloody butcher. He'll win that. And basically, he will die shortly after, essentially brokenhearted. It'll break his heart. So um, yeah, success, the rewards of success. Anyway, here's Vimy Ridge under artillery bombardment. And there's, it looks like a Ross rifle being used as a fence post. And they were. Uh, here's War Artists. We, we, we uh, brought War Artists out for both World Wars because we thought um, artists could capture things that, that, that photography can't. And there's the actual Canadian bombardment. Uh, we will bombard uh, Vimy Ridge uh, uh, basically unceasingly for about uh, 24 uh, hours, uh, seven days a week. The, the hell week, as the Germans call it. We will uh, find the, uh, uh, the German batteries and, and hit them. We will conceal how much artillery we have. Although I, I was looking at a captured German map, and it has a lot of Canadian artillery on it. Um, and uh, we'll even get help from the Lahore uh, heavy artillery unit from uh, India, Sikh unit. So there'll be you know, some turbines on the battlefield uh, manning these cannons as well. Notice how big those shells are. Uh, something like a quarter of a million shells will be uh, hit onto the ridge, and a lot of them are still lying there unexploded. Here's, uh, this is way in the, in the back, uh, the bridge is way to the front. Uh, to get to the ridge, we'll dig tunnels to approach. Uh, this is uh, the planning, this is the aerial photograph I found in the, uh, in the war diary for the second Canadian Mounted Rifles. What you have to remember when you look at this is, well, there's, there's Vimy, there's uh, La Folly Farm, um, aviation hasn't, has only been around since 1903. So this is 1917. We've only had heavier than air aircraft for 14 years. So this is equivalent to a satellite photograph today. And it was the only photograph in the war diary. So I was pretty excited when I found it. 
Um, so 2nd Canadian Rifles would be the center of the assault of the 8th Brigade of the 3rd Division of the Canadian Corps. And what does that mean? Well, I'll show you in a minute, but right now I want to show you where Vimy is. Vimy is in northern France. It's not that far from London. There's a channel tunnel now. So if you're a high school student in the London area, chances are you've been on a field trip to Vimy Ridge because it's the best run park on the Great War. And why? It's run by Canada. We do a good job. We are a competent country. I talked to the soldiers coming back from Afghanistan. Um, and uh, I was not, I was too old to command in the field, but I trained guys that went. And words, uh, they would talk about things like, uh, well, they really wanted us to make our own equipment. They thought Canadian equipment was way better. They even had a phrase they used, Euro trash. Um, but, um, and one of the classified secrets of Afghanistan is, is our full and frank opinion of our allies. Which ones can actually do it in the field and which ones you have to go out and rescue because they got lost. Okay, and I'm not going to go into that. But uh, um, anyway, the British come and they, they, they like Vimy Ridge and a lot of their, their people know about it. And occasionally they come across, we had a, a woman a couple of years ago who saw a row of buttons with maple leaves on them in the farmer's field and excavating yet another Canadian soldier. Uh, every time they clear uh, ground for a shopping mall in the areas, uh, we have 10,000 unknown dead. So they, they come up with our guys. Uh, uh, the maple leaves, the hat badges, like, you're gonna, like you see over here, only much corroded, but at least they identify our, uh, our soldiers. Vimy Ridge was the northern flank of the British Battle of Arras. And here's, it, it's going to be the most successful part because this is a, is a very solid ridge. The map doesn't show up very well in this projector, unfortunately. Uh, here, this one's good. Um, there's the second Canadian mounted rifles right there. There's La Folly Farm, there's Vimy, um, and that is uh, basically, kind of looks like front row center to me. Uh, it should look like the center of the ridge to you too. Um, La Folly Farm was one of two key objectives. The other one was Hill 145, which is up in the 4th Division area, which is where the monument is now. And unfortunately, 4th Division had dissipated their strength in an ill-considered trench raid a month before and it will take them two days to take Hill 145. It will take the 2nd Canadian Rifles 80 minutes to take La Folly Farm. A competent regiment from the Okanagan Valley that knows what it's doing and has a little bit of luck but also some skill too. Um, and good commanders. Here's the captured trench map I was telling you about. The blue here is the Germans, the Germans are in blue, the enemy, which are the Canadians, are in red, and you see there's another trench line down here, um, and that's uh, from the old Moroccan trenches, but uh, here we are, uh, and we will have to uh, uh, push through, and the section that the second aim of rifles will take will be here. The regiment will do platoon training with live ammunition, that's 40 men with the Lewis guns and grenades um, practicing. And then uh, Johnson will have the range increase on the rifle grenades by sawing off uh, the rifle grenade launchers. He'll actually just have the armor shorten the barrels on the rifle grenade launchers, which you really would get in a lot of trouble to do if you did that today. Anyway, Canadian snipers, the second CMR snipers, will dominate no man's land. They'll have 64 confirmed kills. And our snipers will be out there on Christmas Day, 1916. Uh, I know you've heard about the Christmas truce of 1914. Well, that was British troops. The Canadian troops don't get 10 days leave home every six months where they go home and make uh, their wife pregnant. Our guys aren't going to go home until the war is won or they're so crippled they're sent home. So um, we have more motivation to win and to win is how we're going to get back. There's no gonna, we are not going to accommodate the Germans. Uh, Johnson says any German that stuck his head above the trench on Christmas Day, we shot. Because we want the war over. We want to fight. We're the ones who do the first patrols in no man's land. We're the ones who bring in uh, the beastly trench raids, as the British call them. It's Canadians that do that. And it's aggressive, yes. But we, we didn't invade France. The Germans did. We want to push them out. We want to win the war. Because that's how we're going to get home. The only other time you get, the only time you get to hear a Canadian woman's voice as a Canadian soldier is when you're lying in a Canadian field hospital. All right, so um, we want to win this war. We're not going to do the Christmas truce. Uh, we are um, um, quite aggressive. 
Uh, so uh, 64 confirmed kills. We'll use a sniper and um, a spotter to do these. And you only get a confirmed kill if the spotter actually sees, uh, sees the kill. Uh, and this, this, is what, this is how the Americans train today. Uh, by the way, even today, Canadian snipers are still the finest in the world. Second CMR conducted the first uh, Canadian trench raid in the Vimy sector and took a German prisoner to see you know, who the Germans had there. And all four companies rotated forward into the forward trench to see what the ground looks like. And here's a model of the Vimy Ridge trench system that was laid out at the time, um, just so people could see what it looked like. So, and all the soldiers are brought out and briefed on it. And what I do with the uh, high school students, I'll actually lay out a model and ha divide them into four rifle companies and walk them through. The regiment will do two months of rehearsals. So it's like a play. And we'll also rehearse uh, if the uh, officers are dead, if, if the sergeants are dead, if there are no commanders at all. And it's just you privates, what are you going to do? And the idea is you've got to do something. You just don't stand there, but you know what the mission is and how to do it. So where, where, there's no man's land. Where are the German tunnels? We found them. We're going to block their entrances. Uh, what's going to happen? Uh, so everybody, if your commander is dead, you step up and you're the commander now. Uh, here's the tunnels we dug to, to move up. Here's uh, some underground quarters. Uh, here's uh, 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 a pretty trench system. They didn't look like it then. These are uh, uh, concrete uh, sandbags now. Uh, here's the uh, half quarter million shells. There's a lot of them unexploded, so it's best to have sheep out there. Not, you know, it's better to have a three-legged sheep than a one-legged human being. Uh, German, uh, some German pillbox bunkers for machine guns. And more preparations. German trench raid captured two CMR soldiers, Privates Burgess and Hastings. We got, when we did the attack, we captured the um, interrogation reports. And the Germans thought they were rather in unintelligent, didn't seem to know anything. And yet they had been rehearsed on the plan for two months. And uh, uh, they knew enough not to tell the Germans what was going on and what our tactics were going to be. The battalion got a band. Uh, basically, <laughs> what Johnson did was he got all the officers to make contributions. And they bought, a ba a bought band instruments. He got new clothes. Uh, he managed to arrange baths at least once a week in a drying room to dry out their socks. No cases of trench foot in the regiment, and they're in the trenches from October to April through the winter in France. And why no trench foot cases? Because I can tell you why. Because the officers and sergeants are inspecting the men's feet, making sure they put on dry socks, making sure they rub whale oil into their feet, uh, make sure they're taking care of themselves and not letting their feet rot off. Uh, rum will be issued right before the attack. They'll have breakfast and then a rum issue right after. So you've got some, uh, and we still have. Um, rum, I, I was in the Canadian Army and we still did rum issues. And uh, it's not enough to, to get you drunk, it's enough to make you not worried so much, about, not worry too much about dying anymore. So just take your mind off that. Um, here's the attack, zero dark 30, zero uh, 5.30 a.m., just as uh, first nautical twilight's breaking out. Um, good weather for Canada. Uh, there was snow blowing into the Germans' uh, faces. Uh, late snowstorm in April in France, uh, which is great because Canadians love snow and it makes you feel like home. Uh, so over the top. Uh, looking back everywhere were flashes of red and white flame from the leaping guns. While well, looking forward, the fires of hell seemed to be raining on the doomed German lines. Nearby, our shrapnel barrage slow, sh showed as a line of red hot fragments in the still dark morning, moving forward at the rate of 100 yards every three minutes. Further up, the thermite and HE bursting on the German defenses looked like miniature spouting volcanoes. Best of all, best of all, one could see by the light of the bursting shrapnel our men moving steadily forward. And this is where Johnson had to make a decision, his planning. Uh, he knew that as soon as the attack was launched, the German sentries would launch their flares, and the German artillery was targeted on the first Canadian trench. They would know that trench would be jammed full of Canadian soldiers, and they, they wanted their, their rounds to land on it. Johnson's now had uh, two, over a year of combat in the Western Front. He knows what the Germans are going to do. So he's going to violate doctrine a bit. As soon as the H hour comes, he's going to have the entire regiment move forward into no man's land, spaced about 50 meters apart. Uh, a, uh, B Company, C Company, D Company, A Company has got to cut the whole, uh, laneways and the barbed wire. And so we'll all be out in no man's land. And when the German counter barrage comes, it's going to land on an empty Canadian trench. 
And that's the secret to why the second CMR had the lowest casualties in the division and perhaps in the Corps in the assault. We, did, we abandoned our trench and got out of it and got forward in no man's land. Uh, this tactic in the Vietnam War, the, the Viet Cong will use it on the Americans, it's called hanging onto the belt buckle of the enemy because you're so close in they can't use artillery. Now with the artillery, the only protection these men have is Canadian artillery. The artillery is a creeping barrage and it's called the Vimy Glide. So you get up, the leading company will be just behind the exploding shells, the shrapnel exploding in front. And the idea is that as the shrapnel moves over the German trenches, uh, that will keep them down and in their bunkers and in their tunnels. And as it moves on, you'll be right behind it with your rifle right on top. You'll get on the, rip of the lip of the trench and the Germans will be coming up with their machine guns to set up on the parapet to mow you down and you're going to be up there and it's going to be hands up Fritzy boy. Or words to that effect. Um, and we'll take prisoners. We'll take them by the hundred. Okay, and so B Company seizes the first German trench in minutes. C Company passes through them. And C Company's got orders. Don't help B Company, just ignore them. Go right through them. If somebody gets wounded, leave them. Because if you stop to help the wounded, now you've got two men out of the line. We're still taught that. These are lessons from Vimy. Uh, C Company sees the second trench line, which is the main German trench, Schleswig Stelling, 25 minutes after H hour. So we've got now the, main, the first trench and the second trench. Now D Company under uh, Lieutenant uh, Hinky uh, took La Folle Farm, the third objective, 650. So now we've gone 80 minutes into the battle and we have now taken all three trenches. Uh, a Company now will take the final objective, Red Line. It's called Red Line because an officer just took a, a red uh, Chinagraph pen and drew a red line on the map. It's over the ridge crest. The Germans hadn't dug a trench there. We're going to dig a trench there because we want to have some observation on the, uh, the Great Plain around uh, Vimy. And just over the ridge before 8 a.m. Large numbers of German prisoners taken from the deep dugouts. Eight officers, 183 unwounded Germans. Uh, enemy dead, impossible to estimate due to destruction by Canadian artillery. 47 soldiers of the 2nd CMR will be killed in this attack, and 151 wounded. Now that was considered, by Vimy standards, moderate casualties. Actually, pretty light. By modern Canadian standards, we lost 158 soldiers killed in Afghanistan. Uh, and we lost uh, probably close to 1,000 wounded in Afghanistan. Our wounded uh, uh, figures got to be classified military secrets. But um, we're now casualty averse. Well, the thing is, Afghanistan, the existence of Canada as a nation was not at stake. In World War I, uh, we felt the existence, our existence as a nation was at stake. And in World War II, yes. And when the existence of Canada is at stake, uh, for what I know of our young people that I've taught in college, I have no doubt that they would perform as well as these men. No doubt in my mind at all. But if the existence of our country is not at stake, then let's not waste our soldiers' lives, okay? Let's try to be careful with them. Um, and most of these casualties are German artillery fire once we've got to the red line. And here's the German main line. And here's a captured 77 millimeter field gun. We captured one at La Folle Farm. This is before it was restored. Uh, this one actually uh, wasn't, this was captured at another uh, battle later on in September of 1918. Um, we also got three machine guns, one trench howitzer also captured by 2nd CMR at, uh, at Vimy. And this is the one we captured at Vimy, fully restored. Remember I told you about that one unit that came from Victoria? The one rifle company that came from Victoria? Well, they got the captured gun, okay? <laughs> and, and actually, I don't know whether they, uh, they were all allocated by the Dominion Archivist uh, after World War I. And uh, so you, you, uh, we, we took home every single gun we captured from the Germans in World War I. We didn't do that in World War II, but we did in World War I. And the reason is we had something to prove. We wanted to prove we were a nation among other nations that we could do it, we could take these weapons from the Germans and drag them back to the far end of the empire, to, you know, colonial outposts like British Columbia. And it's fully restored, and there's a, a reenactor in a Canadian uniform at the time, except he, uh, uh, at Vimy they were wearing steel helmets. This would be the, uh, the uniform for behind the lines. Now there's what the crew would have looked like at the start of the war. They, they weren't camouflaged at the start of the war, but by 1918 they've gone to this uh, 
Dazzle camouflage. And here's the gun we have up in Verdun, uh, not Verdun, sorry, Kelowna. Um, this is restored German trophy gun in Kelowna. And there's Walter Vita and Tom Wolf. They sit with me on the board of directors for the Okanagan Military Museum in uh, Kelowna. Now, holding the ridge, the battalion went into the assault on 9th of April, 23 officers, 664 men. When, um, full strength would have been 1,000, but you're never at 1,000 because somebody's always sick or on training or, or you haven't had your casualties replaced. Uh, when it was relieved on the 11th of April, down to 14 officers and 353 soldiers. And here they are, over, right overlooking the town of Vimy. And um, on the red line, you, these guys are digging in because uh, there's no German trench, really. you just got to get those machine guns dug in as fast as possible. Uh, these tactics are called bite and hold, where we've bitten into the German line, and now we're going to hold it. Um, the, we had broken through the German line, but even the soldiers at the time said, um, now that we've reached the limits of our artillery uh, 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 protection, uh, to go on, we wouldn't have uh, the artillery, so we'd have to wait till the artillery is moved up. Uh, this will be the tactic so we will actually defeat Germany in 1918 in 100 days. Bite and hold, bite and hold, bite and hold, uh, until we've driven them back to the, uh, beyond, uh, into Belgium, and then Germany will negotiate a surrender, uh, negotiate an armistice so they can claim they didn't uh, actually surrender. That's another issue. If you have me back in 2018, I can talk to you about the Battle of Amiens, uh, that which is uh, the battle where we, we actually break the German will to fight. The Canadians and Australians are put, Australians are put side, to, side by side and break the German will to fight. But that's in the future. Uh, there's Vimy today. Beautiful monument. Uh, built, a, dedicated first in 1936 and then restored in the 21st century because of acid rain had really damaged it. Notice the view. Tactically quite important. Here's Captain John McGregor. He was a sergeant at Vimy Ridge. Uh, got his first uh, Distinguished Conduct Medal there. And gets promoted to Lieutenant. Wins the Military Cross as a Lieutenant in the trench raid. Gets a Victoria Cross as a company commander at Cambrai and during the 100 days push against the German Army in 1918. That's when he got through the last major German field fortifications. And he took a, a German machine gun. Um, it was an unbroken belt of barbed wire. His men were stuck. He took a rifle from a still living soldier. The soldier said, I was alive. He took my rifle. He just told us uh, to uh, watch because uh, the, the unit had hesitated. And uh, McGregor was going to show him how it was done. He jumped over the barbed wire, got to the German machine gun position, 12 soldiers there. He bayoneted four of them, and the other eight surrendered. Uh, when you look at this guy, you've got to think of a, a Rambo with a Scottish accent. He um, gets his second military cross with his, uh, with his company when he captures two bridges intact five days before the war ends. And we fought all the way to the end. Uh, we wanted to keep the pressure on the Germans uh, so they wouldn't change their minds. Uh, his soldiers proud of Vimy, so is Canada. Uh, very proud to, to have won this, uh, this great victory. First time all four divisions had fought together and fought uh, really well. Uh, here's the monument being dedicated in 1936. Uh, this is the sacrifice medal if you get wounded uh, since uh, 2002 in Afghanistan. This is the medal we've given to our wounded. And that is uh, where we got the art, right off the monument. Um, so that's an excellent piece of Canadian history uh, to be worn by wounded soldiers. Uh, Hitler, by the way, toured France. We missed him by two months. His regiment was on Vimy Ridge and was rotated out two months before our attack went in. So Corporal Hitler came back in 1940 on his uh, European tour and had a look at Vimy Ridge. And uh, what he did when he saw World War I monuments, if they had, say, French soldiers bayoneting Germans, he blew the thing up. When he saw the Canadian monument, he thought uh, it was a good taste. And he actually ordered the German army to protect it. And uh, he carried on. Probably the most monumental, the most impressive monument to World War I uh, in Europe. Four taken prisoner of war by the Germans. I told you about two of them. Um, this is a rather low number. The Germans even noticed it. When they got a Canadian prisoner, they were quite excited. I read one account, Canadian prisoner taken by the Germans. Germans are really excited to get them because they don't see a lot of Canadian prisoners. Because we tend to attack and we tend to win. And when you win, all the wounded are your guys. And you're taking the enemy wounded prisoner. They're not taking your guys wounded prisoner. So uh, in World War II, the same thing will happen. 
Um, uh, the British have analyzed us. Uh, we were, the, in World War II, the, the country, the English-speaking country with the lowest numbers of prisoners of war captured by the enemy. And the British think there's something in the Canadian national character uh, that makes us not want to surrender, not want to throw in a towel. So after Vimy, the Canadian Corps became the shock troops of the British Empire to be used when all other troops had failed. When the Scottish, the Irish, the English, the Australians, the New Zealanders, when they've all failed at Passchendaele, the Canadians will be thrown in November. The, the battle will have started in July. And by November, there is no trace of surprise left. The only surprise is the attack is continuing. There's deep mud, and now Canada is thrown in, and uh, we'll actually uh, take, the, take Passchendaele. In World War II, there'll be Sherman tanks. Uh, there they are fighting against German Panther tanks. And uh, casualties much lower, but mainly less combat time, less contact time. When you're in tanks, you're pulled back after the battle uh, to rest and refit and repair your vehicles. You're not stay kept in the line. Uh, there I am giving a thumbs up when we went uh, back to being an armored unit. And I'm in Yakima, Washington, 2004. And I've got just in front of me is uh, Major Paul Randall, who's right there. <laughs> he had the vehicle in front of me. And uh, we, were, we took part in the Okanagan Mounted Mountain Park Fire 2003, Task Force 2 BCD, uh, under Colonel Sear. And there's the Apple Bowl. We took that over and had the tents up until the grass started to turn yellow, and then we moved them out. And these are all British Columbia Dragoons um, from the Okanagan. I'm just looking for somebody right from Penticton. Um, okay, he's from Vernon. And the future, um, future of the Canadian Army Reserve, and the answer is yes, yes, and yes, uh, there is a future. Uh, uh, unfortunately, military is still uh, part of our, our world. Uh, and right now, Canadian troops are deployed overseas in Latvia and Poland. And we've got an assistance mission to Ukraine. And we were looking at a UN mission in, in Mali. Uh, so we do have troops overseas. And we have troops, uh, about 200 special forces in Iraq training the Kurds to fight uh, the Islamic Caliphate. Uh, and we also have Air Force in Kuwait, no longer the jet fighters, but we have refueling craft and reconnaissance craft. So we are in it. We are out there, uh, even though Canadians are dimly aware uh, of just where our troops are, but, but we're out there. Uh, and we do take part.